This is Partners in Crime with Adam Croft and Robert Dawes. Here we go. Hello. Welcome <laughs> to Partners in Crime. Um, we're here. We're live. Ah, it's good. 130 it just, it just episodes says in. your host has unmuted my mic. Oh, yes. Yeah, not your mic. Like, coughing and singing in the very, background. Sounds very painful to me, that. Anyway, yes, hello, everyone. <laughs> uh, welcome to Partners in Crime 130. Yeah, not doing too badly, are we? 130. We say this every week as if we're absolutely amazed, which in fact we are. We are. But uh, it's been a busy week. Yesterday we were talking to each other over this wonderful... Uh, so I've got an Ethernet connection now because my Wi-Fi goes all wobbly and keeps on pulling out. Um, so I've grown up and got myself a long Ethernet cable. It has to go from the router, which is in the front of the house, all the way through the house, causing a natural hazard to anyone else who lives here. Uh, people have been tripping themselves up and cursing and um, uh, oh, what have you, and connects into the, my little laptop here. And life becomes a little steadier, a little firmer. Our foundations in partners in, in crime are secure they are we're trying to improve our our technology and and what have we each week um but uh, and you know what will happen we'll, we'll perfect it and then the lockdown will be lifted and we'll have spent hundreds of pounds uh, thousands of pounds on gear and then we'll be allowed to sit next to each other anyway which will be nice but yes fingers well, crossed it will be nice actually I, I miss my cups of coffee down at uh uh, Shea Croft. The free ones. Uh, and I particularly miss our garden broadcasts, which well, um, obviously yeah. are out of the question at the moment mm. um, on, on every level. But uh, they're great fun. Yeah, looking forward to that, definitely. Getting the, the Partners in Crime tent back out and um, and doing some doing some outside stuff. That is a lot of fun, I've got to say. But I realised the last time we did it, I actually uh, sort of slightly burnt my knees. Because we tend to sort of dress very casually when we're in the garden and wear shorts. And because we do it under cover of your tent, my knees apparently were sort of out of that cover. Ah. And I got back and they were rather red. Oh, there we go. This is the sort of detail that our listeners absolutely love. This is behind the scenes information. This is stuff you, you don't normally get. Bob's brown knees. Bob, Bob there we go. That's the uh, episode title sorted. So... Um, <laughs> we should say, before we begin, and before too many people stop listening, we should say hello to um, our new patron this week, um, David Nickel from Life in Norway. We um, read out one of his articles wow. um, last week oh, on yes. the show, didn't we, remember? We, yes, um, we, we did, yes. We were talking yes. about that, and within about 10 minutes of that episode airing, he'd somehow been alerted to it, found it, listened to it, and signed up as a patron, which is impressive. That's the that's Norwegian... Um, organization for you isn't it so yes uh, well i'm i'm incredibly impressed thank you welcome david it's nice to have you on board absolutely it is yes we um we're going to norway later in the show uh, once or twice as well it does come up in some of the news items that i've got here um while we're on patreon though patreon we'll also say that there's a new book of the month because it's a new month it's now february and uh, we're now into year four of uh, partners in crime which is um odd the, uh, the the book of the month <laughs> <laughs> this month for Partners in Crime patrons is The Widow by Will Patching. It's the first Ooh. in the Deadly Inspiration series. Uh, here's the, the blurb. A brutally murdered husband, an abused wife who wanted him gone for good. Did the wealthy widow arrange his death? And can a disgraced detective discover the truth? That is uh, available absolutely free to Partners in Crime patrons who get early access to every episode of Partners in Crime. They get to watch it in full HD video as well, which is, is an experience, especially when Bob's got his red <laughs> knees out. And they also get access to an extra bonus episode each week, Partners in Crime, Arsenic and Old Lace, which we do after the uh, the main episode. Get that shout out on the show. And of course, a free book of the month each month, courtesy of Kobo. If you want to be our next patron, head over to patreon.com forward slash Partners in Crime podcast or follow the link in the show notes. And um, just to show you how good our videos are, if you go over to the Partners in Crime YouTube channel or look on any of our social media channels, You'll see the video we recorded yesterday as we're talking, so Tuesday, um, and and put out of us playing um, Foul Play, which I've I've lost. Where is it? Uh, I've got mine. Let me reach okay. for it here. You've got your prop. I've somehow there we are. tidied up. There you go. Foul Play, uh, the, uh, the murder mystery card game, which was a lot of fun. You can uh, watch us playing It certainly is. That. It's certainly an experience because 
Um, I, <laughs> when we played the game, I wondered if you might have had a look at it in advance. You haven't. And I was watching you literally taking the cellophane <laughs> wrapping off of it at the start of our, um, our video chat yesterday. We did a little run through. And within about three minutes of Bob taking the cellophane wrapping off and saying, oh, I'm not very good at games like this, or oh, oh, I'm not sure I understand the rules, but I'll have a go, he'd wipe the floor with me within about three minutes. Um, wow. And the second wow. time round, the one that we recorded, he dragged that pain out over about half an hour um, and, and basically gave me um, a death by a thousand cuts and slowly dragged it out <laughs> until we uh, get to the end. And he goes, I think I'm going to have a punt. And, of course, got it absolutely right. So I'm well, not, I'm not playing games nice with you to, again. To, no, well, no it's, it's best not to. But, I mean, you know, it's very kind of you. Thanks for the praise. But it's not that I'm particularly good at playing games. I'm just that bad. Absolutely terrible. <laughs> That sounds about right. Um, so on to um, happier subjects, for me anyway. Um, Ellie Griffiths has got a new book out. She certainly has, um, yeah. The, the Nighthawks. Um, she's back in Norfolk with this one. As treasure hunters find a body on a North Norfolk beach, a couple die at Lonely Black Dog Farm, and rumours of a drowned asylum seeker, a demonic dog, and murder swirl across the salt marshes, um, according to the Eastern Daily Press. Forensic archaeologist Ruth Galloway is back and um, bob you're a big fan aren't you uh, oh absolutely i love that series i think it's it's it, it's beautifully written uh, as are all her books um it's uh, it's not just uh, uh, that series that um uh, ellie writes um and her loyal readers of which there are many 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 thousands um uh, adore the fact that she's so versatile um but anyway this the new book i haven't read it yet it is on order and i look forward to it tremendously very atmospheric with great characters um set up in uh, uh east anglia Mm. And so uh, you don't hear East Anglia very often. You hear the East now. It's called the East, the East, East of England. East, yeah. well, um, but uh, East Anglia set up on the Norwich coastline there, and it's a fascinating, uh, always a fascinating uh, uh, investigation. Um, she's a bone doctor. No, she's a doctor in uh, forensic um, forensic bones, um, and <laughs> uh, and uh, she has uh, uh, a relationship, um, uh, well, on and off relationship with a, a police inspector and a. Uh, um, Mystic, um, who is one of the main characters as well. Who anyone? Not going to go into it. Anyone who knows her books will, will love them. Anyone who doesn't, start at the beginning and work through all thirteen. They're fantastic reads. It is. They are. And yes, and we will actually. They do. They do get a mention. Actually, that couple, uh, Ruth Galloway and Harry Nelson, do get another mention later. In the show, um, which might even end up running over into Arsenic and Old Lace, actually. But that's back. Uh, that is out now. Sorry, The Nighthawks um, by Ellie Griffiths. Go and I've got get a segue your... from that, if I may. Go for just it. To inter- I do interrupt. love a segue. I'm not, uh, not going to say because, no Because uh, there is a wonderful interview with um, uh, Ellie uh, Griffiths uh, in the Times Sunday Times uh, Crime Club. And uh, we mentioned this uh, the week before last and uh, Mark S- Sanderson, uh, who's a, a terrific uh, reviewer of, of books and um, and runs this club. Um, he has an interview and a review of uh, uh, Ellie's latest book. And he also starts, had a little bit here, which I, I quote from, from him this week. More than 20 crime novels are published for the first time this week, most of them on Thursday which is oh. tomorrow or yesterday, if you're hearing this on Friday. Mm-hmm. So far, I'm aware of just two that are due next week. This is madness, says Mark Sanderson with an exclamation mark. Why can't publishers talk to each other and stagger their releases? There would then be less chance of deserving titles being overlooked. No danger I'll of that. I'll tell you why, Bob, well, because they all know best. That's why. Ah, uh, ah, uh, OK. Well, there's no danger of that here, though. In general, the books featured in Crime Club, he goes on to say, are published the week it is sent out, but occasionally a little flexibility with publication dates is necessary. Still, as May West said, too much of a good thing can be wonderful. Um, that's my <laughs> May West, isn't it? Terrible. But anyway, so I that's a little segue. Back to you. Back to the studio. Well, I'll kind of try and invent a segue there. So you're talking about too much of a good thing can be uh, can be marvellous, can be wonderful, whatever it was you said. I was too busy. Too much of a good thing can be wonderful. 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 Said Mae West. Good. And, and now you. Once upon a time. Um, <laughs> there was an yes. article in Forbes this week um, with the headline, Love Lupin, read the books that inspired the hit Netflix show. Um, weirdly enough, it, it's got to be probably easily one or two thousand words, this article, um, in which 
the guy recommends two books. One of which, um, when he says, you know, if you love Lupin, then try reading these books. The first one of two is Arsene Lupin, A Gentleman Thief by Maurice Leblanc, which is not, I, I don't really get the, the logic of, if you like Lupin, read Lupin. I mean, I mean, yes, but the other book, <laughs> <laughs> the other book he recommends is Raffles, the amateur cracksman by Ernest William yeah. Horning. Um, Arthur J. Raffles, a crack cricketer and master thief, um, was the invention of Arthur Conan Doyle's brother-in-law. In fact, uh, I didn't realise. I didn't know was, that. Was his brother-in-law, yeah. Well, both of those are, are let's call it classic. Uh, crime yeah. books going back many, many decades. I mean, the Lupin to the uh, uh, 19th century. Mm. Uh, indeed, so it's interesting that, of course, if you tune into the television uh, series, um, you won't be aware of it actually being set in that period. So the, it's a very, 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 very modern day um, adaptation of, uh, of of the books and owes uh, as much in its own way to Ocean's Eleven and various other um, great um, uh, films uh, to do with high um, uh, what have you than anything else but yeah the original books I've only read one of them uh, are, are terrific so I'm quite right well, on if, the... if, you, if you like your classic detective uh, fiction go back and get the, uh, the originals yeah well, on, on the Netflix adaptation, um, Moriarty has plucked uh, another article about that from the, the depths of the internet this week and this one from a, a website called CNA Luxury um, so he, he have had articles from Forbes, CNA Luxury as well. So I think Moriarty's getting ideas above his station this week. We uh, maybe we're paying him too much. Um, <laughs> I bet he disagrees with that. Well, so would I actually, because um, he 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 isn't paid. He actually lives off the blood of orphans. Um, He's getting a hundred percent more than I do. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, he, uh, yeah. Well, less than a hundred percent. Can't really negotiate a rise on that. <laughs> no, no, exactly. <laughs> Though he does a brilliant job. He yes. deserves he deserves everything oh, the, the, and more. The two Moriartis, in, in fact, as we've um yes, we the two just, to, just to break that illusion. But um, Is yeah. that our own particular spin on Moriarty? That we, we, we have two Moriartis working at the same time. Moriarty is a concept. It's a thought. Oh, it's an illusion. Right, um, See, I didn't know that. Yeah, it just, no make, just makes a sound more interesting. Yes. Yeah, so, mm, the, the, the French crime thriller series Lupin centres around a diamond necklace, say CNA Luxury, uh, once owned by Queen Marie Antoinette of France. Um, but they, they, they go into this article, is the necklace based on fact or fiction, essentially, is, is what they were asking. Um, Marie Antoinette, of course, had a reputation for excess, and her lifestyle made her the subject of hatred among people during the French recession. There were rumours that she spent a fortune on decadent clothes, wigs and jewellery, including lavish diamonds and pearls. The Queen, of course, did not make it through the French Revolution, says this article that I'm reading word for word, please don't sue me, but her jewellery did. For centuries, it was believed that all the crown jewels had been lost when Marie Antoinette and the king attempted to flee France. In reality, she pl placed her prized jewellery in a wooden chest and passed it on to Florimond Claude, the Comte de Merci Argenteau. Thank you very much. Take a bow. An Austrian diplomat and loyal retainer to the Queen. <laughs> the collection. Are you all right? <laughs> That's going to have to be repeated ad nauseum what? again and again. Uh, Florimond Claude, Comte de Merci Argenteau. <laughs> Oh, God, it doesn't get any better with repetition. Carry on. <laughs> and made it safely into the hands of the Austrian emperor, who was Marie Antoinette's nephew, before being passed back to Marie-Therese, the last surviving child of the French monarchy. It remained in the possession of her heirs, unseen to the public for 200 years, until it resurfaced on the auction block in 20. 18, one of the most royal, uh, important royal jewellery collections ever to appear on the market, according to Sotheby's. But is the necklace itself fact or fiction? There was, indeed, an important diamond necklace, it says here, in the history of Marie Antoinette, but it was never owned by her um, and, in fact, led to her demise. In 1772, King Louis XV commissioned an outlandish diamond necklace from Parisian jewellers Boma and Bassange as a gift to his mistress. It was reportedly made out... <laughs> What? <laughs> that, 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 that Parisian crime busting duo. Beaumont and Bassange, yes. Crime and Bassange. <laughs> on Grenage. <laughs> Sorry, carry on. It was reportedly made out of 600, 647 individual diamonds for a combined oh. weight of 2,800 carats, which is one hell of a Christmas dinner. Well, if you're a diamond thief, that's just the sort of thing you're looking for. It is lots and lots of carrots. 
Okay, well, here's something. You know that the, the Raffles was uh, often uh, adapted for film and television. Yeah. Do you know who played him in the television series? I think it must have been in the 70s now, 70s. Oh, I like to think that I think it's someone 70s. like David Niven. Well, I think, and I could be wrong, and I know there's going to be hundreds upon hundreds of people who know the answer out there who will tell us in no uncertain terms, and please do. Uh, but I do think that David Niven did play Raffles on the big screen, but who played him on the smaller screen? A slightly smaller David Niven? You know all the answers, don't you? No, it wasn't. I, th I think, and again, I could be wrong, so let me know. It's no good actually putting this out as a, qu a, a question because, one, there's no prize, and secondly, all people have to do is Google it. So, I mean, there's no... You either know it or you don't, but you don't know it. I think it was Anthony Valentine. It was. I've just looked it up. You're correct. Yeah. Anthony oh. Valentine. 1977 oh. television series, yeah. That's it. Raffles. Yeah, and who I've else was that. in that? He had it. Yeah. Who's who's his faith? Raffles faithful. It's not like someone like Snowy or Bunny Manders um, was Bunny. Christopher Strowley. Oh really? Victor Karen and Victor Strowley. Brooks. Two Victors. Yeah. Oh gosh. Yeah. Well, there we are. It hasn't been done for ages. They're doing Father Brown. Maybe they should look. Maybe it's a bit elitist. A diamond. You know, and I suppose it's it's a sort of a a, a narrower seam to mine than uh, murder mysteries. Maybe. Sort of. Yeah, maybe. But, but so, anyway, yeah, well, it's like, working. It's working for Lupin in another. another it is. Sort of that, that genre seems to be. Yeah, um, working. So I'm talking as usual. Total rubbish. Fine. Do carry on. We've got to get some content from somewhere. I will. I can't help it. <laughs> I mentioned um, people who were uh, coming up in the show. The reason is that Publishers Weekly have um, put out a list last week, actually, of the ten most dynamic detective duos in crime fiction according to uh, their journalist, Joanna Schaffhausen, um, who's who, well, actually she's a novelist. Um, she, her fourth novel um, is out now, Every Waking Hour, um, put together her favourite crime-busting duos. Number Ooh. one, she comes up with um, a controversial, interesting one, actually, Mary Russell and Sherlock Holmes uh, from Laurie King's books, in which they um, imagine a different sort of sidekick for the famous detective in her series of books centred around Mary Russell, which begins with The Beekeeper's Apprentice. Uh, later, the pair marry and form a crime-solving team, with young Mary dragging the brilliant detective out of retirement to investigate mysteries that have echoes of some traditional Holmesian plots. Um, Good grief, I she have no to... idea about that. No. She also goes for Coffinhead Johnson and Gravedigger Jones. Oh, uh, brilliant, yes. um, brilliantly named uh, pair yeah. there. Uh, black detectives working in New York City streets in the 50s and 60s by uh, author Chester Himes. Of course, we've spoken about numerous times on Parts and Crime before. Um, Lincoln Rhyme and Amelia Sachs, Jeffrey Deaver's detective pair. Of course, one of my all-time favourites, Mikhail Blomqvist and Lisbeth Salander from um, Stig Larsson's Millennium yes. Trilogy. Um, some of the books that got me into crime fiction, actually, yeah. in a big way. It is. It's interesting, but you never had a tattoo. Have you got tattoos? You don't have tattoos. I yourself, don't. Do you? No, not visible. You weren't inspired to get your own tattoos. I wasn't. No. Most people I know these days, sort of, you know, when the conversation comes up, even people you, you least ex expect, although I haven't uh, mentioned this to our local mayor, he probably might surprise me, have a sort of a little hidden away tattoo, something. I've got a little rose on my bum, and or I've got a little, little, I don't know, something up here or down there or around there that you can't see hidden away, a little private personal tattoo. Yeah. You don't have one. No. Is there something you want to tell us? No, I don't have one either, but I don't think you'd tell me if you had either. Well, I have. So, I have. anyway. I, I, I'm, not, I'm, trying so, to imagine I'm not going to investigate. I'm trying to imagine <laughs> what you might have and where. And I mean, thankfully, I haven't eaten. I was planning to do so after this. But um, I don't know. I don't, you haven't got, like, I'll live a, dangerously a, on your calf or something? Or... No, it'd be a little tattoo of a Kit Kat or, a, <laughs> or sort of a, a, a jam donut. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's, uh, Custard the cream on, my... above your navel. <laughs> Tattoo creativity for you. <laughs> well, maybe that's just the crumbs that are a bad down. idea, actually. <laughs> um, hide what's hide what's behind it. <laughs> if it's on my navel, right? Carry on. <laughs> it's it's like an X-ray for what's inside there, isn't it? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> A little sneak peek inside. Uh, so, um, number five was Peter Decker and Rena Lazarus, Faye Kellerman's favourite pair, a favourite pair, famous pair. Um, 
don't just take that in um, in isolation. Me talking about Fake Elements, famous pair. Um, with book one, The Ritual Bath, they first appeared, which LAPD cop Peter Decker has to find a rapist among Rena Lazarus's conservative Jewish community. Um, Issa Katak and Rachel Getty, who appear in uh, Alzma Zahanak Khan's thoughtful, suspenseful crime series, uh, Muslim detective Katak and his Jewish partner Rachel Getty. They're based in Toronto. Uh, Claire Ferguson and Russ Van Austin uh, from Julia Spencer Fleming's books, who make an unlikely match when they first team up in In the Bleak Midwinter. She's a reverend, he's a police chief in small town Miller's Kill, New York. Um, Rex Stouts, Nero Wolf, and Archie Goodwin. Um, Patrick Kenzie and Angie Gennaro from Dennis Lehane's uh, books, early ones, uh, World Weary Blue Collar Investigators, exploring the seedy side of South Boston. And number 10, Ruth Galloway and Harry Nelson, who have been circling yes. each other and solving crimes, it says here in Eddie Griffith's wonderful series. Um, I should also point oh. out, Bob, I've just had um, a message come through from... From Moriarty, who suggests that um, the tattoo that you might have might be "I Heart the Right Way." <laughs> That's um, a wonderful sitcom you're you're best known for. <laughs> I Heart the Right Way. <laughs> yes, yes, best known for. Uh, well, thank you very, thanks very much, Moriarty. At the height of your career, <laughs> as ever, I look forward to the falls. Um, so. Um, yeah, oh, that's fun. I thought you were going to include that French uh, detective pair, certainly after your last French pairing, which you pronounced so magnificently a little I thought early. they were in there. I had it at the back of my no, mind no. that we had two articles about Lupin, but it was the other no. two that didn't appear. You didn't mention Lescargo and Boulangerie, that wonderful <laughs> I didn't, no. French detective cu- couple. No, Anton Deck didn't make it in either. Anton De- well, they're no. not particularly good at solving crimes, are they? But yeah. they, don't, they don't profess to be, so oh. you know, there we are. They, they right, might be so, so adept that we don't actually realise Ah, right. Well, there may be. We don't know. We're solving them, not committing them. Uh, right. Uh, so, uh, as ever, I've got my copy of uh, the bookseller, which came through this week. Um, it's thick. It's, I mean, look at all this. I mean, it's just it's it's <laughs> uh, carrying on with Mark Sanderson's uh, 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 earlier comments. I mean, this is the buyer's guide to children's buyer's guide to non-fiction buyer's guide to fiction. I mean, you know, thousands of books being published, and that is absolutely fantastic. But as ever, there is a very good editorial um, uh, by Philip Jones in, in the bookseller, of which I will mention just a few things here. Uh, contrary to what you might read elsewhere, bestsellers, even huge ones such as the Thursday Murder Club or prize winners such as this. This week's Costa Victor, the mermaid of black conch, are not created overnight, but instead meticulously brought to the market. The latter, after £4,500, was raised by its author, Monique Roffey, to publicise the book. Coronavirus may have disrupted The Matrix, but one of the most promising underlying stories of 2020 is how readers responded. And as our international coverage shows this week, on page 6 to 9 for all uh, bookseller aficionados. They did so in all the major English-language book markets, including the US, up 8.2% by volume, Australia, up 78 by value, and Ireland, up 95 and elsewhere when lockdowns allowed. That said, the trade does not exist in a vacuum. This week's milestone of 100,000-plus reported deaths in the UK as a result of COVID-19 is a sobering reminder of how there will be no going back to a time before the virus. The future now is about adjustment, not return. And with recent decline in new cases in the UK, as well as the likely efficacy of the vaccine across the world, a welcome Philip during what otherwise has felt like a dark time. It certainly has. We are fortunate. Books do well in some crises, and they have done well in this one. The numbers should give heart to those who work in this business and hope for the future, whatever the twists ahead. I think that's a very well-written editorial there. And uh, and just shows that, I don't know how much uh, during lockdown and through the whole of this uh, pandemic, uh, reading has come to the rescue of an awful lot of people, certainly in their isolation. Um, and uh, and to keep, as I say, the old grey cells going in, uh, well, otherwise what might be considered rather stagnant uh, and depressing times. Indeed. Um, I, I should just point out, for the in, in the interest of accuracy, uh, Moriarty, who's on absolute fire today, has... Um, reminded me that, in fact, Anton Deck did solve the mystery of who shot Simon Cowell on Saturday Night Takeaway. So. 
I, 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 that is, he's, he's a mine yes. of information, is he yeah. not? Yeah. Or she, is it he or she? Uh, you won't tell me, will you? Mm. You nearly did. Damn, I should have kept my mouth shut. <laughs> OK, uh, see, I don't um, know. <laughs> on, on personal news, um, seeing as you, you're clearly somebody who enjoys audio and things like that because you're listening to us witter on for the last 25 minutes, um, I should mention that the audio book of the first Rutland book, What Lies Beneath, came out this week. Um, narrated oh. by the uh, the wonderful Andy Nyman. That is out now. Um, published by WF Howes on their Quest and Clipper imprints. Uh, would you like to hear a bit? I'd love to hear a bit. I love Andy Nyman. I quite right, like right your button. books Let's too. See. Oh, good. Well, here's the end of chapter one. Bob squinted as they neared, trying to make out the shapes. To him, it looked as though someone had dumped a big bag or pile of clothes on the rocks. But as they got closer... It became immediately apparent to Bob that this was no pile of clothes. He sucked in a breath. Adrenaline bolted through his chest. Bugger me, he said. It's a body. No, there you go. Well, that sounds brilliant, although I would never swear. Um, but <laughs> well, I, uh, technically, I swore and he just read it out. <laughs> God, that sounds fantastic. <laughs> Here's a question. So that's out on what, hmm. on what platform did you j- just say? On, on everything. It's published by WF Howes on Quest, which is their digital imprint, and yeah. on their Clipper imprint as well, uh, which I think is out a little bit later in a few weeks' time, so that'll be through libraries and CD and whatever. Okay, so what's uh, the matter? It's, of course, available through Kobo. Oh, through Kobo. As well. we, would, we would highly recommend. Well, that's interesting because um, it, it, when is it going to be on Audible? Because I've been talking to my publishers and my... my it already is. It, it's on Audible. Mm. Mm. Oh. It's already there. It was delayed going up. They have had lots of issues, um, but this is one of those what? situations where having the, the audiobook published by the biggest audiobook publisher in the UK does help. They did have a bit Smooths of it in through. The, in, in nudging that through, yeah. Ah, well, that's quite interesting because mine was out two, t- ten weeks ago and it's still not um, audible. Mm. So I've got to. I've had them take seven months, the independently done ones. They do push you to the back of the queue, yeah. Oh, really? That's not fair. Mm, I no, I know. I know. I mean, that's not fair. Anyway. Um, but Kobo don't do that. Kobo, get them straight up there. They do. So I would recommend going and getting that audio book from Kobo. Well, uh, while um, we're here, I mean, let me just say, because you just say I, I've had a, a bit of a run of actually recommending uh, books <laughs> that aren't available on Kobo, <laughs> um, uh, for which uh, you pulled me up quite rightly last week. But uh, interestingly enough, this is turning away from speaker, uh, well, well, um, the front cover of Byers Fiction is uh, L. J. Ross, which I think is uh, an author, uh, I mean, hugely p- popular author, but I think she just publishes on um, the, the uh, for the other side. But you can <laughs> get a series of her books on audiobook on Kobo. And mm-hmm. uh, there's one here which I just want to mention. You know why? Why is that? Howes. W.F. Howes. Ah, uh, W.F. Howes. Yeah. Ah. Yeah. Oh, yes, interesting! Yes, wonderful bunch. Well, I'll bear that. I'll bear that in mind. They sound fantastic. Uh, and this one is called Imposter uh, by L. J. Ross. It's uh, an Alexander Gregory thriller. The Alexander Gregory thriller books. There are three of them, all available for audio. And I have uh, listened to about ten minutes of the first one, but I have it on good authority that they're a very good listen. Uh, so um, there we are. That's one recommendation uh, this week. They're supposed to be very good. In the beautiful hills of County Mayo Island, a killer is on the loose. Panic has a stranglehold on its rural community and the Garda are running out of time. Gregory has sworn to follow a quiet life, but when the call comes, can he refuse to help their desperate search for justice? Murder and mystery are peppered with dark humour in this fast-paced thriller set amidst the spectacular Irish landscape. Uh, L.J. Ross is a self-published literary sensation whose books have sold over four million. My, four million? My God, that's probably about three more than yours. Uh, anyway, two Crofts. This, is, this particular <laughs> one is is uh, narrated by Hugh Dancy, if that draws uh, anyone to them. A marvellous actor that he is too. And I believe the other books uh, I read uh, by um, Richard Armitage. So uh, there we are. Uh, get them through Kobo, download them uh, and and enjoy. Yes, and while you're there, um, consider that Partners in Crime is gratefully sponsored 
read into that, propped up by Kobo, <laughs> one, one of the world's largest ebook retailers, as well as having a wonderful selection of audiobooks, as we've discussed. As a listener to Partners in Crime, you can get a massive 90% off of your first ebook purchase from Kobo. You don't need an e reader or any special device, although they are wonderful. You can read on your phone or tablet if you wish. Just head over to Kobo.com, enter the promo code CRIME at the checkout for 90% off your first purchase. And if you're ex- an existing customer, uh, follow the link in the show notes here and use promo code PARTNERS and you'll get 40% off of selected 40%. ebook purchases for life. Thank you to our friends at Kobo for that. Right, I think as far as the main episode goes, we're about done. We've got plenty still to go. Look at all this guff Good I'm going to be friend. talking about. I've got, I've partners got in crime, Arsenic, old lace. boxes of guff here. So uh, if any listeners are prepared to... to if, well, our patrons... Uh, get to listen to this mm, next one. They That's do. It. So if you want to be a patron and you want to listen to us bantering away and bluffing away for another uh, 10, 15 minutes with Arsenic and Old Lace, uh, look into it. Uh, you'd be very welcome. Mm. We'd be happy to see you. And uh, uh, there are various different subscription rates uh, uh, from a pound, I think, to five pounds uh, for a yeah. month. Is that per month or is it per episode? Yeah, yeah, you can cancel any time you like and all of that. And it helps stop us going bankrupt. Right, uh, There's uh, lots uh, of um, fun things in there. I put some, I put a picture of my fat balls in there last week. You did, uh, and um, uh, they were an overnight sensation, certainly in the Mid-Bedfordshire mm. Gazette. Um, <laughs> <laughs> local author gets arrested. Uh, but so, yes, so look, look, look <laughs> again. If, pop, pop in and also read. I mean, there's lots of stuff that we've been t- talking about Moriarty. Um, packed mm. full of information. If you're if into your crime uh, fiction uh, as as much as, as we are, and if you're listening to this, I take it that you probably are, then look at that too, because there's uh, lots of information and uh, and fun to be had with all his notes uh, and um, his strange peccadilloes. Uh, well, Moriarty is going to be doing even more in oh, Patreon, actually, um, with uh, some regular Moriarty's musings, which I've just named there on the spot, um, which I think um, he's going to have a lot of fun with. That was a spontaneous so, yeah, moment on Partners in Crime. Yeah, it's probably the first he's heard of it as well. Yes. I, but, I so don't think I've ever seen him used before. No. No. It's best, I, I, it's best not to. Yeah. I, th- I pull funny faces when I'm used. I'm kind of like... Shall we stop before we get to that stage? Uh, yeah, I think that'd be a good idea. Oh, hang on. You clicked the wrong one. How about this one? Here we go. Partners in Crime was presented by Adam Croft and Robert Dawes and produced by Adam Croft. The theme tune was by the Caesarians. The Partners in Crime logo and imagery were designed by Stuart Bache. Partners in Crime is sponsored by Kobo, your favourite local bookshop, perfected. Bum, bum, bum. Ooh.